I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, Prospective Applicant Webinar for the Post-Baccalaureate Research Education Program, or PREP. Next slide, please. Before we start, I would like to um, offer these um, reminders and this information. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available online. The slides will also be posted. They actually are currently available if you would like to download them now and take notes on the NIGMS prep webpage. On the left-hand side, you will see a box that says latest news and events, and you will see the prep 2022 um, webinar slides there for you to download. As we progress through the webinar, you're welcome to type your questions into the Q&A chat box. We will be monitoring that throughout the webinar and there will also be a Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. So the webinar participants today include myself. My name is Lamise Akasem, and I'm one of the program directors for PREP. I'm joined by Lori Stefanik, who is the other program director for the PREP program, as well as Kenny Gibbs, who is the chief of undergraduate and pre-doctoral cross-disciplinary training branch at NIGMS. Um, from the review, we have Mark Rigas, who is the scientific review officer. And from grants management, we have Justin Rosenswag, who is the grants management team leader. Next slide, please. Before we get into the presentation, I would like to bring your attention to the NIGMS um, training Twitter page. You can follow us at NIGMS training on Twitter um, to get information on research training, um, careers and research capacity building news. Next slide, please. It is important that I offer this disclaimer. Um, so this webinar and accompanying slides are for informational purposes only. They serve as an overview of the PrEP program and are not meant to be comprehensive in coverage of all required components of an application. Applicants are responsible for following the instructions that are detailed in the Funding Opportunity Announcement, or FOA, and any related notices, including in the FOA's Overview Information section, as well as the SF424 Application Guide. So in addition to participating in this web webinar, it's really important that you read the FOA, related notices, and the SF424. Next slide, please. So this screenshot um, is a screenshot of the PrEP FOA or funding opportunity announcement to um, point you to where you can find the related notices. They're highlighted on this slide. Um, this is where you will find um, notices that are relevant to this particular funding announcement. These include relevant policy information and instructions that have been updated since this FOA was released. So it's important that you pay attention um, to these particular notices on the funding opportunity announcement. Next slide, please. So this is an outline of today's webinar. We'll start off with a program overview, um, move into an application overview, and then we will um, get an overview of peer review as well as budget. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the NIGMS training programs that provide support across the spectrum from community to the faculty, from the community college to the faculty level. You will notice um, that although there are programs that may offer support to trainees at the post bac level, PrEP, um, which is highlighted here, is the only NIGMS program that specifically supports post bacs So you can imagine that this is a very competitive program, and we receive many more applications than we have resources for. Therefore, it is important to take the application process very seriously and feel free to reach out to um, the program officers for any questions or support. Next slide, please. Before diving into PrEP specifically, we want to talk about the expectations of NIGMS training programs overall. Um, so NIGMS training programs are expected to focus on technical, operational, and professional skills development Technical skills include those in the areas of methods and technology and quantitative and computational skills that may be specific to a particular research area. Operational skills that include skills in the area of experimental design and data interpretation that are broader research skills um, that can carry over across disciplines. And professional skills that include communication and teamwork and management and leadership skills. 
NIGMS training programs should promote rigor and reproducibility in research. They should teach the responsible and safe conduct of research, as well as promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. They should encourage inclusive, safe, and supportive research environments and use evidence-informed educational and mentoring practices and employ cohort building activities that enhance the trainee's science identity as well as their self-efficacy. NIGMS training programs should provide individualized mentoring and oversight throughout the program and introduce trainees to a variety of scientific careers and research areas. They're also expected to make career outcomes publicly available. Next slide, please. The PrEP program specifically, um, the goal of the PrEP program specifically is to develop a diverse pool of well-trained post-baccalaureates who will transition into and complete rigorous biomedical research focused doctoral degree programs, for example, PhD or MD PhD in biomedical fields that are relevant to the NIGMS mission. And here you will see a link to the PrEP website. This is the link um, where you'll find the slides um, for this presentation, in addition to more information about the PrEP program. Next slide, please. So when developing your program, it is important to consider the following. Mentors should represent a broad range of biomedical disciplines relevant to the NIGMS mission. Participants in the PrEP program should also be spending 75% of their effort on research and about 25% on further skills development. The expectation of this program is that most participants will transition out of PrEP after one year. However, we do recognize that some students may need two years and typically these are MD PhD students. So a second year is allowable if it will help um, enhance the participants competitiveness. What you want to avoid is having the majority of your participants requiring two years and they are not MD PhD students. The vast majority, um, for example, greater than 75% of a program's participants should enter research-oriented biomedical doctoral degree programs, so that is PhD or MD PhD, within two years of completing PrEP. We also anticipate that the PrEP award will have an institutional impact by helping the awardee institutions achieve greater diversity in their doctoral programs. Next slide, please. So I'd like to go over the eligibility for um, PrEP. Starting off with institutional eligibility, the institutions that are eligible for PrEP are identified as research intensive, and that means that they have an average of greater than or equal to $7.5 million in NIH research project grant or RPG funding per year over the past three fiscal years. So again, this is an average of greater than $7.5 million in NIH RPG over the past three years, three fiscal years. In terms of eligibility for the principal investigator, multiple PIs are encouraged for the PrEP program, and the individual identified as a contact PI must have a full-time appoint appointment at the institution. At least one of the PIs should be an active investigator in the biomedical sciences, and the principal investigator or principal investigators should be capable of providing both administrative and scientific leadership. Participants that are eligible for PrEP uh, must be US citizens or permanent residents, and they must have earned their baccalaureate degree um, less than or equal to 36 months prior to applying to the PrEP program, and they should not currently be enrolled in a degree program. An exception to the three-year rule is um, parental, medical, or other well-justified leave for personal or family situations um, or uh, national service. Participants should also intend to apply to a research-focused biomedical doctoral degree, um, for example, PhD or MD, PhD. Next slide, please. So I'd like to bring your attention to a notice that was recently published clarifying um, institutions, eligibility for institutions with multiple campuses. And this uh, notice is linked here. So the application must be submitted by the eligible organization 
with a unique entity identifier or UEI and a unique NIH ERA institutional profile um, file IPF number. For institutions that have multiple campuses, eligibility can be considered for an individual campus only if a UEI and a unique NIH ERA IPF number are established for the individual campus. For institutions that use only one UEI or NIH IPF number for multiple campuses, eligibility is determined for the campuses as a whole or together. Next slide, please. So in terms of the program participants, it is the responsibility of the institution to establish the qualifications of the participants before they are supported by the program. We just talked about eligibility of participants to receive salary support. However, it is up to, up to the institution to identify and um, appoint individuals to the PrEP program or the PrEP grant. Institutions are strongly encouraged to identify candidates who will enhance diversity on a national basis. And you can see the notice of NIH's interest in diversity, which is linked here for more information. Next slide, please. So this slide outlines the PrEP key program dates. Um, the FOA or funding opportunity announcement is linked here. And you can see that next application due date is January 31st, 2023. These applications will be reviewed in June, July of 2023 and go to October Council. The earliest budget start date for these um, grants would be December, 2023 and receipt dates, as well as review council and budget start dates for the subsequent or following um, two cycles are also presented here. We encourage you to submit early to allow for adequate time to correct for errors um, that might be found during the submission process. Next slide, please. So now we will transition into an application overview. Next slide, please. So the first step in preparing an, your application is to read the funding opportunity announcement. Again, that is linked here, PAR 22220, related notices, and the SF424 application guide thoroughly. Um, again, uh, as a reminder, the related notices can be found at the top of the FOA as shown at the beginning of this webinar. And these are linked to policies and instructions that have been updated since the FOA was, was released. So it's important to pay attention to these notices. In this presentation, we have indicated um, with a star things that have been updated in the last year and a prohibited sign for things that could cause an application to be withdrawn. So a first uh, change is that um, grants or applications that are due after January 25th, 2023, must use Forms H, and failure to use Forms H could result in application being withdrawn. Resubmissions are also no longer allowed for PrEP. However, applicants who are not successful are encouraged to apply again with a new application. And again, this um, submitting as a resubmission could cause uh, the application to be withdrawn. Next slide, please. Please be aware that there are page limits for your application. If these page limits are exceeded, the application can be withdrawn prior to review. Please see the link at the top of this slide um, for the page limits. Once you go to that page, you can look for the research education or R25 uh, table that will outline these page limits. And again, as a reminder, resubmissions are no longer allowed. If you are applying again after an unsuccessful application, Follow the instructions for a new application. That is, do not include an introduction. Resubmission applications will be withdrawn prior to review. And if page limits are exceeded, the application is also uh, will also be withdrawn prior to review. Next slide, please. So here we are showing the PHS 398 research plan form, which you will use to upload the bulk of your application. Again, be sure to use Forms H and version H of the SF424 instructions. So since resubmissions are no longer allowed, you will not include an introduction. In the research plan section, um, the section contains the specific aims, the research strategy, which will be used to upload the research education plan and a progress report publication list if applicable. 
In the following slides, we will go through all of the components of the research education plan, which will include the details of your program design. In the other research plan section, we will talk through the letters of support and resource sharing plans of the application. Also note, if you designate multiple uh, PIs, you should include a multiple, multiple PI plan, which includes a rationale for choosing a multiple PI approach, as well as the governance and organizational structure of the leadership team, including communication plans, processes for making funding decision, or sorry, for making decisions on scientific direction and procedures for resolving conflicts, the roles and administrative, technical, and scientific responsibilities for the project um, should also be delineated for the different PIs on the program. It is unlikely that you will need to upload anything for the vertebrate animals section or select agents or authentication. This would only be necessary if you have a course for prep participants where they will be using vertebrate animals. If participants will be using vertebrate animals in their research lab, this will be covered by their faculty mentors grant. Next slide, please. So the research education program plan attachment is the bulk of the application. This is where you'll be able to elaborate on the items that you see listed on this um, page. And this part of the application is limited to 25 pages. We will be going through these different sections um, in greater detail in the following slides and applications that are lacking the start sections will not be reviewed. Next slide, please. So the current uh, status of graduate program section describes the PhD student body in biomedically relevant disciplines. This is meant to help reviewers understand the training environment and the nearest peers of the prep participants. This section should include um, institutional data on PhD students, uh, PhD and student enrollment for the last five years and percentage from underrepresented groups. You should also include the number of PhD students from participating departments or programs. So this would be departments that are participating in your prep program and graduation rates for the last five years, both overall and from underrepresented groups. It is helpful to reviewers if this information is provided in tables and referenced in the text. However, these tables must be included in the 25 pages of the program plan and not in the required data tables, appendix, or as an attachment. So again, do not include this information in the required data tables, attachment, or appendix. They should be found within the section and will contribute to the 25 page limit. Next slide, please. The rationale, mission, and objective section is where you can demonstrate the need for prep at your institution, as well as um, the feasibility give, given your institutional context. Here you will highlight current institutional efforts to promote diversity and create safe and inclusive training environments, including institutional and externally sponsored programs for the last five years. You will also highlight how the prep program will enhance but not duplicate these efforts. So overall, you want to demonstrate what the added benefit uh, prep program will bring to your institution. You should also highlight uh, or include program specific mission and measurable objectives that align with the overarching objective of prep. Objectives should include, but not be limited to program completion rate, percent of participants who will complete the program in one year, and percent of participants who will transition into and complete research-focused biomedical doctoral degree programs, um, for example, PhDs or MD-PhDs. Next slide, please. So the overall research education plan should include descriptions on how research experiences and courses for skills development will accomplish the training mission and objectives and how these activities will help participants develop their technical, operational, and professional skills. You should also describe how these activities will employ evidence um, to inform approaches to both post back participant learning, mentorship, inclusion, and professional development. You should include representative examples of plans for individuals, individual participants, such as 
course, workshop, and presentations, and discuss how participants, participants' progress will be assessed, how will they be guided in the program, and how it will be decided if a participant needs a second year. Providing a timeline for a uh, participant timeline of activities is also often helpful to reviewers as well. You should include the rationale and strategies for selecting participants and explain why potential participants would benefit from prep um, or need additional preparation before attending graduate schools or before attending graduate school. Um, you will also describe activities that will build a strong core cohort while enhancing science identity, self-advocacy, and a sense of belonging among members. And lastly, you will highlight your strategy that will be used to develop the appropriate IDP for your participants um, and explain how the IDP will specifically be used to leverage participants' unique abilities and address their specific points of development. So at this point, I will hand it over to Lori Stepanek to continue discussing the components of the research education plan. Hi. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to continue with details of the components that make up the research education program plan. Uh, the next section is career development. So this should include how participants will be provided with information about career outcomes of the previous participants and about the overall biomedical research workforce employment landscape. How participants will be provided with adequate, appropriate, and timely information regarding the variety of careers in the biomedical research workforce. So not only academic research and teaching, but also industry and government jobs and research related careers and how participants will learn the skills, knowledge, and steps needed to attain positions, um, their desired positions in the biomedical research workforce. Next slide, please. So this section um, should describe the administrative structure and plan strategy to oversee and monitor the program and ensure appropriate participant progress. Uh, it will also explain how the program will ensure that participating faculty use the highest standards of scientific rigor, reinforce materials on responsible conduct of research and methods to enhance reproducibility, and engage in activities that promote trainee career development as described on the previous slide. Um, it should also talk about how faculty are trained to use evidence-informed teaching, training, and mentoring for participants from all backgrounds the mechanism for matching participants with the appropriate participating faculty mentors. So this could involve interviews, it could involve short lab rotations, it could involve faculty mentors skipping short presentations about their research and so forth. And a mechanism to monitor mentoring, including oversight of the effectiveness of the participant faculty match and a plan for removing faculty displaying unacceptable mentorship quality. Next slide, please. A progress report is included only in renewal applications, um, and this should describe the original specific measurable objectives, milestones, and outcomes from the previous project period. The outcomes should include accomplishments like participant research, so this might include presentations and publications by participants and prep supported development activities. It should also describe program outcomes during the previous project period, so typically the last five years, which includes the number of participants who entered and completed PrEP, the percent of participants who completed the program in one year, and the percent of participants who matriculated into research-focused biomedical doctoral degree programs, the number of who have completed the degrees or are continuing in good standing. Renewal applications must submit Table 8D, um, which I will talk about in a later slide. Um, you should also talk about lessons learned from previous program assessments and any resultant changes that were made in the program. Um, we also, in the last FOA, added some language to clarify what we anticipate in terms of institutional impact. So this can include things like impact on the curriculum of graduate programs, um, the training environment in general, or institutional practices. You should also describe any dissemination of findings or materials that were developed under PrEP um, and disseminated to the broader training community. 
Next slide, please. The application should show that the PD or PIs have the administrative and training experience to provide strong leadership of the program. In previous FOAs, we suggested that at least one PI should be an established investigator. However, this term has specific meaning for research project grants. So we wanted to clarify that our expectations are that at least one PI should have an active research program. Um, so this would be typically things like um, demonstrated recent research publications and current research support. Uh, the section should explain how the PD or PIs have sufficient bandwidth to oversee the program, a demonstrated commitment to training the next generation and leading recruitment efforts to enhance diversity and to foster safe and inclusive research environment. NIGMS encourages multiple PIs, particularly when each brings a unique perspective and skill set that will enhance the research education program. So this may include individuals with experience in the science of education, relevant social science disciplines, program evaluation, mentoring, DEIA work, or university administration. And the application should also describe the administrative structure and the leadership succession plan for critical positions, um, especially the contact PI um, and multiple PI PDs. Next slide, please. The program faculty section is about the participating faculty research mentors. And so this should describe efforts to build a diverse team. So for example, in areas such as uh, people from underrepresented backgrounds, women and different career stages and how the participating faculty promote, will promote the success of the participants, have sufficient time to commit to the program um, and I'd really like to emphasize that we and the reviewers pay attention to whether the faculty are receiving training in evidence-informed teaching and mentoring practices. Um, we like to see that the faculty are cooperating, interacting, and collaborating. You should describe how the faculty will promote the development of skills in rigorous experimental design and methods and provide opportunities for participants to conduct research with increasing self-direction. The faculty should demonstrate a commitment to effective mentoring and promoting inclusive, safe, and supportive environments. And finally, how the program faculty will be evaluated as teachers and mentors. Next slide, please. The program participant section should describe a strong justification for the intended participants and the eligibility criteria or specific characteristics that are essential for participation in your proposed prep program. You should explain why participants will strongly benefit or what is the added value of being in the prep program rather than going directly to doctoral degree granting programs and strategies for ensuring that participants have sufficient commitment to careers in the biomedical research. So for example, how, you, how will you identify in applications um, participants with a passion for research versus those who are solely interested in going to medical school? Next slide, please. All applications must include a recruitment plan to enhance diversity. In this, you should describe strategies to recruit participants for underrepresented groups. Note that reviewers tend to wanna to see specific strategies focused on underrepresented racial and ethnic groups and individuals with disabilities. Uh, this plan should describe specific efforts to be undertaken by the PrEP program and how they may coordinate with recruitment efforts of the institution. However, centralized institutional recruitment efforts alone are not sufficient. There should be PrEP specific recruitment efforts. Also note that providing accommodations is not the same as recruitment of participants with disabilities. And we encourage applicants to consult these NIH and NIGMS web pages for strategies to enhance diversity in training programs um, when, you're when you're designing your plans. Um, I should also say that new applications may wish to include data in support of past accomplishments by program leadership, relevant grad programs, or by the institution. And renewal applications must describe how the proposed plan reflects the program's past experiences in recruiting individuals from underrepresented groups. Next slide. 
All applications must also include a plan for instruction and methods for enhancing reproducibility. This should describe how participants will be instructed in principles important for enhancing research re reproducibility. Uh, describe how the instruction strategies are well integrated into the overall curriculum and how participating faculty will reiterate these key elements um, while they're training the participants in their labs. Again, we provide resources here that include NIH funded training modules that could be incorporated into prep programmatic plans. Next slide. Uh, all applications must include a plan to fulfill the NIH requirements for instruction in the responsible conduct of research. There are five components that must be addressed. This should be appropriate and reasonable for the nature and duration of the program. So we recognize this is only a one-year program, but you should also pay attention to things like not leaving all of the RCR training until spring after the participants have been working in labs for months. So the plan should make sense for what the participants are doing and how long they will be there. Renewal applications must describe any changes in formal instruction over the past project period and plans to address any weaknesses. And all participating faculty who served as course directors, speakers, lecturers, et cetera, um, should be named in the application. The RCR policy notices describe expectations around things like topic area, duration, and methods of instruction. Next slide. The program evaluation plan should describe the process to determine whether the overall program is effective in meeting its mission and objectives, and whether the scientific research climate is inclusive, safe, and supportive of participant developments. Um, it should also uh, include plans for using assessment to update the program and expand on the outcomes data collection and storage plan, which is an attachment that I will describe a little bit later. The evaluation plan should explain how participant career outcomes will be tracked and how data will be safeguarded and preserved. And as a reminder, the NIH contribution towards evaluation costs are limited to a maximum of $3,000 for the five-year project period. The dissemination plan uh, should involve nationally disseminating any findings resulting from or materials developed under the PrEP program. Examples might include web postings, presentations at scientific meetings, or workshops. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, okay, so that was all the research plan section. So again, that's gonna go in those 25 pages. So I'll now talk about the other research plan section. Um, so as Lamy said, we don't expect vertebrate animals, select agents, or authentication plans to be relevant here. Um, this, the participants' research in their mentor's lab should become covered by their mentor's research grants. Resource sharing plans are also generally not applicable, applicable to PrEP. However, you should include a software dissemination plan um, if you're requesting financial support for development, maintenance, or enhancement of software. A multiple PDPI leadership plan should, be, should only be submitted if the application designates multiple PDs or PIs, but in that case, it is required if there are multiple PDs designated. And in the next slide, I'll talk about the letters of support. So two letters of support are required, and if not included, the application will be considered non-compliant and not reviewed. The first of the required letters is the institutional support letter, which is limited to 10 pages. This should describe the support provided by the institution that's designed to ensure the success of the plan program and its participants. This might include financial support, other types of resources, or activities, policies, and practices that will support the program. The content will likely be different for differently resourced institutions. And the funding opportunity announcement has a long list of examples that might be discussed in this letter. The second required letter of support is the institution, institutional eligibility letter, which is limited to one page. 
This certifies that all of the components of the institution under the applicant's unique entity identifier or UEI um, has an average RPG or research project grant funding equal to or greater than $7.5 million in total costs per year over the past three fiscal years. Other letters of support are permitted. So for example, letters from recruitment partners or deans or department chairs who are contributing resources to the program. Um, these letters may not contain any of the information required in the institutional support letter. Next slide, please. The appendix is meant to provide additional details on the following topics, but it is not meant to substitute for clear descriptions in the body of the application. Do not include any items other than the allowable materials, as doing so will result in administrative withdrawal of the application. You may include a summary sheet listing all of the applications or all of the items included in the appendix um, in the first page of the attachment. So I'll describe each item in more detail in the next slides. Okay, so there are two required appendix items. Um, the first is brief descriptions of the required research education activities that all prep participants will complete, and two pages maximum are allowed per activity. The other required item is the syllabus or syllabi for responsible conduct of research. Note that this is different than the plan for instruction of responsible conduct of research that is included in the research program plan, so look at the FOA to see what should go in each section. Next slide, please. There are three optional appendix items. So one is elective activities. So here you can provide brief descriptions of the content of up to four elective courses or training activities. These are limited to no more than two pages per activity. The section can include a conflict resolution protocol, which is limited to three pages. So this can describe protocols for addressing issues with the program participant and faculty matches, removal of faculty from the program if they have unacceptable training or mentoring skills, and for conflict resolution between the PD, between the PD and PIs um, or between mentors and mentees. And then finally, you may also include evaluation and assessment instruments, which would be blank surveys, rubrics, or forms. Um, that are used to document participant progress and determine whether the research education environment is effective, inclusive, safe, and supportive. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are finally to the last section of the application, the other attachment section. There are three required attachments for new applications, four for renewals, and I'll go over um, each one of these. Uh, I will remind you that as many of the other things, you should not, um, applications won't be reviewed if they do not include the required attachments, if they include unallowed attachments, or if they exceed the page limit. Okay, next slide. Faculty biosketches should be tailored to the prep program. This means that the personal statement should address a commitment to training, mentoring, and promoting inclusive, safe, and supportive research environments. Typically, faculty will include experience with mentoring students from diverse backgrounds and an interest in promoting diversity in biomedical research. We realize that it can be a big ask to request faculty to tailor their biosketches but reviewers see this as a commitment to an understanding of the prep program that they are supposed to be a part of. Um, the faculty biosketches may also address a record of and providing training in rigorous and unbiased experimental design methods, interpretation, and reporting of results. Um, and although this is not brand new for this year, in the last couple of years, the biosketch format has changed, so you might want to pass that information along to your faculty if they haven't submitted a grant in the last couple of years. Next slide, please. The outcomes data collection and storage plan is limited to two pages. This should describe a plan to track the outcomes for all supported participants for a minimum of 15 years after the individual's participation in the program. 
you're encouraged to make the aggregate outcome data available on your institution's website and describe how the aggregate data will be de-identified before public posting. This should also describe a strategy to ensure the secure storage and preservation of program data um, so that it's centralized, it's safeguarded, and it's accessible um, if the leadership of the program changes. Next slide, please. The training data table four is to provide evidence of the strength of the research environment, the avail availability of funds to support research conducted by participants, and the appropriateness of the participating faculty in terms of their areas of research. Because participants are early in their career, we like to see a breadth of research topics represented to provide participants with options. Programs focused in a single research area are low priority for funding. In the research program plan section, so that 25 pages, you might comment on the inclusion of faculty who don't currently have research grant support and how the research costs of trainees who may work with these faculty members will be supported. Next slide, please. Um, for renewal applications, Table 8D is required, and this permits an evaluation of the effectiveness of the supported research education program in achieving the training objectives of the prior award periods for up to 15 years. It also provides information about the use of post-bac training positions. So for example, the distribution by faculty member and the years of support for, per postdoc. So I'll just quickly go through this. Um, so the trainee name, the faculty member they work with are fairly, fairly self-explanatory. The start date should be the date that they started in prep. The support during training is listed at TY1 as training year one. And so the GMR25 would be the grant support. Um, so that would be the prep award. Sometimes students are supported for two years. So you can indicate whether a second year or TY2 is also supported by PrEP, or it might be supported by the university or by an individual faculty mentor. Um, you should indicate the year that they received uh, the bachelor's degree, and generally that should be within three years of their start date, but there are some exceptions, as Lemise described, and then any subsequent degrees that the participants receive. Um, the topic of research that they worked on while in PrEP, their initial position is what the participant did immediately following prep, and then the current position is what they're doing now. And we would appreciate, uh, also the reviewers would appreciate if you would specify um, PhD or master student and not just use the catch-all term graduate student. And again, I'll emphasize that reviewers really look at this table. The NIH also uses this table for overall programmatic evaluation. Um, so it is a very important table. Next slide, please. And then finally, the attachment section can include an advisory committee plan. Um, this is not a required component of a research education program, but if you have one, you should describe how the advisory committee will assess the overall effectiveness of the program, the roles, responsibilities, and desired expertise of committee members, the frequency of meetings, and any other relevant information. Um, in order to avoid conflicts of interest, only name pre-existing advisory committee members in the application. Um, don't include people that you haven't asked yet. And renewal applications with advisory committee members, however, should include the names of all committee members during the past project period. All right, and then finally, uh, next slide. I just wanted to mention some common pitfalls um, that can hurt your score during review. Um, so one is not reading the FOA and notices thoroughly. So this webinar may seem really long. Uh, <laughs> this was a very streamlined version of the FOA. There are many more details in it. So just make sure you read that uh, very carefully. Um, unclear or incomplete presentation of data. So reviewers don't like to see outcomes exaggerated and they will often compare what's in the narrative versus what are in table 8D, for example. And they'll be very unhappy if you say that 90% of participants go on to PhD, but they can only count 60% of them going on to PhD in, in the data presented in table 8D. So make sure everything's aligned.
Um, another issue is if the specific aims do not align with the institutional assessment and resources. So you might read a paper about a great prep program, but its goals may not make sense for the population that you're serving or your institution's resources. So you really wanna think about the context of your program. Um, the proposed project lacks innovation. So uh, that is the activities don't align with the stated aims or don't employ the latest evidence informed educational practices. Um, so here you wanna make sure that you include some updated literature um, innovation can sound kind of intimidating, I think, and we don't expect you to start from scratch when you're developing a prep program, but your program probably shouldn't look identical to another program with different institutional context, and your program probably shouldn't look the same in year 20 as it did in year one. Um, another common pitfall is a failure to state program challenges and strategies to address them, especially for renewals. Um, it's important for reviewers to see that lessons were learned um, from previous iterations of the program. Um, again, the faculty biosketches should be up to date and relevant for research education programs. Um, it shouldn't be what your faculty member is necessarily using for an R01 or where some kind of request for equipment where they're talking about how they need a cryo EM. Uh, so again, that those should be tailored uh, for the prep program. Um, and the last thing I'll say, which I didn't write on here, um, but another common pitfall is to bury or omit important information. Um, reviewers won't necessarily read between the lines. And oftentimes you become so familiar with your program that you can forget to state the obvious. So it's helpful to have some outside readers look at it and make sure you aren't forgetting a major key important component of the program. So I'm now going to turn this over to Mark who is going to go through peer review. Thanks, uh, Lori. And I, uh, I think I won't take a, a ton more of your time on the on the peer review things. Just a few things I wanted to, to mention to folks uh, as, as you're preparing your applications, this comes down the road. So uh, go ahead and uh, switch to the next slide, please. Uh, review of the prep applications occurs in um, two NIGMS standing review panels. Um, TWD C and TWD D. They'll be assigned to one of those two, and assignments are just kind of made really almost randomly. Really, they're they're distributed between the two panels to balance conflicts and workload, um, things like that. So there's no rhyme or reason as to why you will get an assignment of one or the other. You can see the the rosters uh, membership of these uh, standing review panels at the link as provided in the slide. Uh, the membership will be relatively constant. There'll be some additional members brought in um, periodically um, as what we call ad hoc members as well. Um, you'll receive a receipt letter from the scientific review officer, someone like me, uh, a couple months after you submit your proposal, detailing uh, information about when the review meeting will happen, how you can provide updates for your applications, what's allowed in that respect, and then that link to the uh, committee roster. And finally, the scores and the summary statements um, will be available within uh, summary statements within several weeks after the review meeting date, uh, and they can be accessed through the PI's uh, ERA Commons account. Next slide. Um, so uh, review of applications, again, like we, we've kind of, Lamise and Lori and I are, are going to say a lot of the same things. Do read um, the funding opportunity announcement carefully, and particularly read the review criteria uh, as you're preparing your application. Now, the review criteria that I'm going to go over very quickly in a moment uh, are designed to track with those required components of the application that uh, Lamise and Lori just went through with you. So all of the items that the reviewers are looking for, the reviewers are gonna be instructed to use the review criteria in their evaluations. Those really match up with the, um, the co required components and items that the program is looking for uh, that Lori and Lemmy's talked about. Um, and based on those review criteria, the reviewers will provide an overall impact score to reflect their uh, assessment of the likelihood for the project um, to advance research education by fulfilling the goals of this program. Uh, next slide. So let's talk about the review criteria. These are directly, this, these words are directly from the funding opportunity announcement, so you don't need to read them here. Um, they're available to you. Um, the standard NIH review criteria are used, significance, investigator, 
approach, um, in a, uh, innovation approach and environment. Uh, in particular, with respect to significance in the context of PrEP, um, note that we're interested in um, uh, evidence that, uh, you know, the um, that the proposed program will provide participants from diverse backgrounds with expertise that will allow them to transition into and complete rigorous research-based uh, doctoral programs. So that's really the significance factor in this uh, as relevant to this funding opportunity. Next, please. And so with respect to the investigators <clears throat> for this funding opportunity, this refers to both the PDs and PIs as well as the group of training faculty. Uh, as my colleagues have already indicated, at least one member of the PDPI team must have a record of research in the biomedical field, and reviewers are asked to evaluate uh, that. Um, the PDPI team should also have a demonstrated commitment to training the next generation of researchers. There should be some evidence in their background for this that the reviewers can evaluate. Uh, as far as the program faculty, reviewers are asked to consider the breadth of biomedical disciplines represented on the training faculty, as well as whether or not the training faculty comes from diverse backgrounds, and if not, whether there are sound plans to enhance faculty diversity. Uh, so that's what's considered by reviewers uh, in, with respect to the investigator criterion. Next slide, please. And again, please don't try to um, to read these all right here. Uh, this is all just taken directly from the funding opportunity. So one thing I want to call your attention to with respect to how we we how the reviewers will look at the innovation criterion in this funding opportunity, the investigators should make a case um, for reaching an uh, that they're reaching an audience in need of the program's offerings, that they're um, doing the, a, a strong job of, of doing that uh, and using the best practices as well as sound and innovative approaches to achieve those best practices. So innovation in kind of um, evidence-based practices, right? We'll talk about that in just a moment when we get to approach. So go ahead, next slide. Um, so the, you know, we're looking for innovation, but uh, reviewers will have to be convinced that it's feasible, right? So are, are, the, um, are the recruitment plans reasonable? Do they sound like they're gonna work? Um, are the approaches evidence-based for training, mentorship, and inclusion? Is there a effective administrative structure to run the program? Does the plan sound reasonable? To um, Does it uh, include appropriate faculty? Uh, is there a plan for how you're going to match the participants and the faculty? Um, and does that seem effective? And then kind of how you're going to um, evaluate the effectiveness of those matches as you go through the program. So kind of the nuts and bolts of operating the program and um, running the, the, the training program is all covered in this review criterion. The last one is environment. So next slide. Um, and the environment, what we're specifically uh, referring to in this case, is there institutional commitment to this training program? Uh, that's one of the things. So is there evidence, strong evidence of institutional commitment uh, are the appropriate facilities available to, to foster the um, types of scientific research and education that's being proposed here? Will this, the trainees have access to appropriate facilities? And is the institution committed to um, kind of all in for this type of a program? Um, so uh, next slide. There are some additional review criteria that do factor into the score. Uh, and some of these refer directly to um, uh, additional things that are documents that are required that um, Lamise and Lori talked to you about. Um, train, uh, these do factor into the score training and um, methods for enhancing reproducibility respons uh, and responsible conduct of research. Okay, and in this case, human subjects, vertebrate animals, biohazards is probably not relevant uh, to most of these proposals, but renewals will be. Um, so if you're putting in a renewal, you have that section that talks about your um, work under the previous funding period, uh, reviewers will evaluate that section as, and consider it as part of their um, overall impact score. There are additional review considerations that are not scored, they're not score driving. Uh, one of those is resource sharing plans, which won't be uh, um, won't be relevant for most of these applications unless, of course, you're developing software, uh, in which case you, you could talk about 
in, in a resource sharing plan, how you will share that software or, or you know, what the methods are for disseminating that. And then finally, the budget and uh, period of support. Okay. Um, so the last, uh, oh, actually, um, let me do this one thing. Okay, before we do the last thing, application reminders, just remember um, resubmissions no longer allowed, so you don't submit as an A1. Read the funding opportunity thoroughly. These are all the same disclaimers we've said before. Make sure that materials are supplied in the correct locations um, per the instructions in the funding opportunity, so upload them to the right spot in the SF-424 and allow enough time to carefully check your application. Um, because we can accept it after the receipt deadline and applications will be withdrawn if anything is missing or unallowed materials are included. So my last slide, if you'll switch, talks about the timeline. Um, these come in at the end of January, so January 31st. Typically takes us one to two months for that to get referred um, out to the review panel. I know you, I just told you it's only gonna to go to one or two places. Why does it take so long? There's a lot of steps that have to happen uh, when your application comes in. It filters through several layers of review at NIH. Uh, it finally ends up down to the um, individual scientific review officers who run the two study sections and they'll have to figure out workloads and what's coming up and they'll be just finishing their work from the previous round, so it all takes time. Uh, but about again, about two to three months after submission, you should get a, a letter from that um, scientific review officer explaining your assignment and all the relevant dates. Review panel will happen um, by um, um, middle of the year, next year, and then the summary statement will be available about one month after the review panel. And scores are usually available within a few days after the review panel. So, um, with that, I will ask for the next slide, and we will move on to the discussion of grants management. I'll turn Thanks, it over Mark. to Justin. Thanks, Mark. This is Justin from uh, NIJMS Grants Management. Uh, next slide, please. Just going to go over a couple uh, key points um, regarding the budget that you want to keep in mind as you assemble your applications. I'm going to take a minute for this. Um, this has already been referenced earlier in the presentation, but applications may request up to 10 postbacks positions for each year of the grant. And support is allowed for participants in the form of salary or wages. Total compensation can include fringe benefits and tuition remission and fees. Also, something you can request for your participants, of course, is travel. Applicants may request support for travel of prep participants to attend or present scientific papers at domestic scientific conferences. Next slide, please. So the total um, direct cost for each award is are limited to 400,000 annually, and the total project period may not exceed five years. So that means that you can have up to $400,000, you can request up to $400,000 in direct cost each year for up to five years. And of course, it, because this is an R25, it's a uh, participant support mechanism, indirect costs are not at your institutional rate, but they're at a set 8% of uh, modified total direct costs or MTDC. And so for this program, the only, what you wanna keep in mind is, is, it, it, is it is exclusive of tuition and fees and expenditures for equipment. Next slide, please. A couple key points from the program related expenses section. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list, but um, this, is, this is just a few items that we want to highlight. Consultant costs, equipment, supplies, travel for key persons, and other program-related expenses may be included in the proposed budget. Limited program evaluation costs uh, can be included. The cap on that in the announcement is 3000 uh, for the entire five-year uh, training for the entire um, budget period. It's not $3,000 per year, it's $3,000 for uh, um, the, the, the project period, which typically your request will be for five years. A single consolidated budget for prep is required with each item clearly uh, justified. That just means that, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this by now, that this is on the SF-424 research and related um, budget and that, has several sections that you have to fill out and it gives you the opportunity to list all of your items. And then of course you have to justify all that each item in the budget justification section. Next slide, please. Of course, another big uh, part of your budget request is uh, personnel effort. 
Individuals designing, directing, and implementing the research education program may request salary and fringe benefits appropriate for the person months devoted to the program. Now, the 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 second and third uh, bullets are key um, because they are actual caps um, from the announcement. Salary support for the PD, PI, or combination of multiple PDs or PIs is limited to up to a total of 1.2 person months. Tempers, another way of saying that is 10% um, of full-time effort per year. Equally important to keep in mind, salary for a program coordinator to assist the PD, PI is limited to up to six person months or 15% of full-time effort per year. Next slide, please. Now, this isn't something you have to worry about necessarily when you're putting your application together, but um, if you are selected for funding if you, and you do have a funded program, you have to keep in mind that um, all of your prep participants must be appointed uh, in X-Train. X-Train is the way to track uh, the participants. Um, and it's something that each participant will have. Um, obviously, they'll have their ERA Commons account through the lifetime of their research, any kind of awards they get in the future from NIH. Um, will be attached to them via their ERA Commons account. So this is all to say that um, using X-Train is super important in, 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 for the individual participant's career. So all prep participants must have an appointment form submitted through the ERA Commons to X-Train before they may receive compensation. And if participants cannot continue in the grant program for the full appointment period, an amended appointment must be submitted to X-Train with the correct appointment period. If you know anything about X-Train, typically you have to um, do a termination notice uh, to end an appointment, but um, R25s and a couple of the other mechanisms that use X-Train, they don't use termination notices, they just go by an amended appointment. Next slide, please. Oh, and that's just uh, the bottom of the slide is just um, a link to the X-Train user's guide. Next slide, please. And I will be turning this back over to Lori and Lemise now. Thank you, Justin. Um, so I see there are some questions in the chat, so we'll go through those. Um, so the first question was, is there a rule of thumb or guidance on how many trainee participant slots should be requested by a new application? Um, so as Lemise said, uh, the number of slots you request should be appropriate uh, given your institutional context. Um, and one of the things we mean by that is the number of faculty mentors that are available. So typically we look for maybe two to three times the number of faculty mentors um, as participants you're requesting each year um, to kind of spread, uh, spread the faculty's time around and to, again, to give participants options. Um, Often we'll, we'll award four or five participants to new programs, but again, you should ask for what you feel you can support um, and what you can justify. Um, and then the next question was, how long has PrEP been running? Um, and in recent cycles, what is the fraction of renewal versus new applications and the success rate of each? Um, so PrEP has been around for over 20 years. Um, I'm not sure of the exact date. Uh, and the fraction of renewal versus new, I'm not sure about. Um, you can look, and I can put this in the chat, or maybe someone else can. Um, there on the prep webpage, there's a link to the TWD dashboard that shows the list of all current programs. Um, and so from the, the project number, you can see how many years the program has been around. So if it's five years or less, that was a new application that was awarded. Um, and I don't know if Kenny, you have anything else to say about that? Nope, I agree. Uh, okay. In, in its, its current iteration, there was an earlier version of PrEP from the early 2000s. There was a little rethinking of it before any of us were here, but it's been running um, for a pretty long time, uh, I think since about 2009 in this current iteration. And you can see some of the programs have um, award dates of uh, 18, and even one has one of 21 years. So it's been going for a while. And we encourage new applications. And so it's not a closed system. As Lori mentioned, new people are able to enter the system. And if programs um, are not making the uh, outcomes as determined, then they, um, they sometimes leave the system. 
Okay, thank you. Um, the fraction of PrEP uh, participants who continue in a PhD or MD PhD at their uh, at their PrEP institution, um, I think that varies a lot from program to program. I don't think it's typically much more than half, but again, it sort of depends on the institutional context. If they have a lot of participants who uh, are comfortable and want to stay in that area, um, or if they're participants who want to, you know go other places. Um, and I think it also may vary some with how long the program has been around. So with more established programs, the, the students may go, go to more places outside of the institution that they participated in prep during. Um, but I think there's really a variety. Um, let's see, the position the trainees will have during prep um, so that is up to the institution. So they may be technicians or research, uh, research assistants or associates. Um, it is an employer employee relationship. Um, so I don't think, I, but then depending if they're taking classes, I'm not sure how they're exactly classified. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in there. I'm not sure I understood the entire question, but they are um, in an employee-employer relationship at the institution. Um, that's how uh, most, or basically all R25 um, programs are assembled. It's an employee-employer relationship. Okay, uh, thank you. Hopefully that sort of, it's pretty much up to your institution is the answer. <laughs> but you can talk to us offline if you have specific questions. Um, okay, then Diane asked an effective way for PIs to convey that they're performing ethically sound, rigorous, and responsible for research other than stating a strong commitment. Um, I think that's a good question. Uh, so I think, you know, certainly publishing in peer reviewed journals is, is going to make some assumptions that <laughs> hopefully the peer review process is going to ensure that they're conducting rigorous and ethical research. Um, I think if they describe any trainings they've participated in or uh, any practices they have with their own trainees that they, they encourage them to participate in training. Um, those are some ideas I have, again, if anyone else has seen I, anything. I, I, think, I, I, think those are great. I think those are great ideas. And I would just add, you know, um, the, the FOA and across NIH, there's some ideas about methods for enhancing reproducibility. And so even talking about, you know, biosketches or other things, how they work to ensure um, um, adherence to those principles, right, in a, in a manner that seems specific and convincing, as opposed to, I, I want to do these things, but with some specifics. In the same manner that we see about commitment to mentoring, some will say, I'm a committed mentor, and then some will write with specificity to substantiate that commitment. So, um, but we encourage you to, to, to explore the different ways that they might do that. Uh, Mark, would you like to talk about compliance checks? Yeah, my favorite topic. Uh, no, I just wanted to remind uh, folks that some of the things that we've talked about as far as the required components, uh, unfortunately, those aren't checked at submission by the ERA and, and grants.gov and all of the systems. So they are checked manually, which means that you could essentially have you think and think, oh, it's great. I got a successful submission. I got no errors and the submission went in. Whereas you could still be missing some of the required prep components because those are checked manually later during the referral process. So um, just wanted you to be aware of that, that a successful submission does not guarantee that everything was in place. So that's another reason just to read carefully and make sure and give yourself plenty of time. Yeah, I generally like to recommend that people try and upload things at least 48 hours ahead of time because you have a 48 hour window that you can kind of recheck everything in your application um, and then withdraw and resubmit if you find that you forgot something. Um, but you need to get that done before the, the application due date. So just try and do it a little early so you can catch those things. Um, site visits for prep. Yes, we have not done site visits for quite a while. 
They were they were retired. I put a link to the NIGMS feedback loop post from July 15th, 2020, with the head of our division for training, workforce development, and diversity, and the head of our scientific review branch talking about the new practice of retiring the site visits for our training programs. Um, as appropriate, we because we don't want to do that as part of the review process to ensure fairness for all applicants. It is possible, um, particularly as needed, that there might be staff visits post review in the in the context of you know post award monitoring, and if we you know want to uh, come check, but we don't do them as part of the review process any longer. Okay, uh, there's a question about um, if you can't fill the allotted slots. Um, so that's something we keep an eye on. Um, Jen, every year you'll submit a progress report. Um, and so we'll look at that. If it's if it's a one time thing, that's not really that big of a deal. Um, with the R25s, there's automatic carryover. So you can carry that money over um, and then request uh, approval for an additional participant in the following year. Um, if it's something that happens repeatedly, uh, then that's something we look at and decide if um, we should reduce the award for future future years. Do you see the follow-up question, Lori? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so yes, you can support a participant for a second year um, at your discretion. That's not something you need to ask for prior approval for. Um, again, the goal of the program uh, is to encourage participants to uh, be supported for one year. But again, if there are circumstances where it makes sense to support them for two years, uh, then that is allowed. All right, so I'll just remind everyone, please get in touch with Lemise or I if you have questions about your applications prior to review. Uh, once they're submitted, reach out to Mark, um, and we're happy to help you. We're happy to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and answer questions by email. Um, so thanks for attending, and good luck, everyone, with your applications. We look forward to reading them. <laughs>